five, four. We are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Joe, do you know why some businesses succeed and some businesses fail? Why some businesses grow and some businesses don't? That's what this show is all about. Business, business, business. All right. Another Saturday morning. Here we are. The poor That's people right. in New York at six o'clock in the morning must really love that music. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically. Gotta wake them up every time. And uh, today's show, where is everybody? What, 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 we lost our host or what? Our co host? Also, so, John is still chasing Nazi gold, apparently. He's always, he, he's always. always chasing it. He's Argentina. He's going to find it if it kills him. I think David's still in traction from his 18 year old mistress. That's right. Um, yeah. and, and apparently, Nick is wrestling, I was going to say a kangaroo, but they don't have those in South Africa. And Nick's doing something in South Africa. It's probably against the law. We can't discuss it. So uh, nobody's here but us two today. So, That's right. That's but, but today it doesn't matter because we have two special guests, which we're oh, very yeah. excited about. One's, one's a returning champion, um, Michael Collins, who's here every every few months to talk about the, the author, the author the of uh, Saving American Manufacturing and uh, yeah. with the 30 year history in uh in knowing about manufacturing and advocating for american manufacturing so yeah. happy to have him back on the show we'll have him and then we have a gentleman name and you're going to pronounce his last name better than i will so i'll just let you do the whole thing his first name is aaron his aaron, last name is aaron zaramanian okay there you go if it's wrong he'll tell us when he he'll comes tell us in a moment yeah, that's, that's right. right thank god we both have like advanced degrees but we can't say we can't speak english so that's what we do perfect 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 stuff so no so we're excited about today's show so you guys listening on the podcast thank you for being here you guys that are watching us i'm sorry um so it's the best we can do we'll have we're going to play a brief commercial and then we're going to bring our guests in and then we're going to go from there so lost and found today it's just michael and i so We've sorry if you're expecting show. Did David to give you a Fakakta story about a cow saving the planet? So here we go, kids. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. All and right. And before we bring them in, we'll do one more. And then that's commercial free after that. You know, we got to pay the bills. That's it. So. <laughs> do it. Making the right connections is vital to your business and professional success. But reaching out to strangers is awkward and mostly a waste of time and resources. Imagine a world where AI takes the hassle out of networking. Enter Hero, your noise-free, professional network powered by AI. What's so cool about Hero? How about getting your own AI networking assistant that's dedicated to solving your challenges by handpicking connections and opportunities that are right for you? But Hero does more than just meaningful matchmaking. We equip you with a customized storefront accessible to anyone on or off the Hero network to help enhance your brand and boost your revenue making it easy to turn those meaningful connections into valued customers all within Hero. Hero is networking as it should be, meaningful conversations with well-meaning people without the noise. All right. And there is Michael, and there is Aaron. Here we are. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. How, how do we do on your name, Aaron? That was pretty good. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you know, you got the Z part right. Past that, you massacred it. Don't worry that's about right. those consonants yeah, and vowels. They mean right. nothing. So that's right. All good. So, all a to good. Z. A to Z. so a tell to us Z. a little bit about yourself, Aaron. Um, uh, so I guess the best way to put it is I'm a consultant for the most part. I do a lot of risk analysis based on macro and geopolitical trends. So I do a lot of uh, risk analysis for companies, for um, portfolios, individuals, um, anything that has to do with things that are not usually covered when it comes to um, risk. Mm -hmm. Most people think micro, what can affect me right now around me? I'm thinking more like what global trends are happening and how does that affect each individual asset that you own? Perfect. 
We are a geopolitical show, that's for sure. That we've is got, very true. We've got Collins on, Michael. So tell us a little bit about yourself, even though the listeners, we hope, have seen you before. All know you. They all know you? Yes, I was a general manager for 35 years in manufacturing. For a company, we built robots and palletizers and automatic lines, and we built them for the S&P 500 corporations. So I had an inside look at what they do and what their strategies are. And I, once I finally retired in 2005, I went back and started uh, writing, and I've I've written five books now, and about 460 artic my articles have been published since 2007. But well, I but I'm a, I was a manufacturer and on the front lines for a long time. So well, Michael's done nothing since his retirement. So there you go. So <laughs> <laughs> we love the articles, though, Mike. So why don't you tell us? Do what the topic what the most recent topic is around training and okay let me start off by saying that that the manufacturing institute and deloitte have published re a couple of years ago their projection was that we were going to be 2.4 million workers short skilled workers and i just i followed the bls Jolt's database, and it showed that in December, there were 600 and some thousand unfilled manufacturing jobs. Now, if you look at articles on training, they're almost all about did the digital revolution and the smart factory. There are very few, if any, articles about where, how we are going to train these uh, skilled workers that we need to fill these um, the requirements. Um, and uh, let me start off by saying, I follow, I've been following nine key industries since 2001 in the BLS database. And it shows the number of companies and it shows the, the number of employees. These were of industries like machine shops, tool and die, forging and stamping, semiconductors, machine tools, etc. But they are key industries because they make things and feed other manufacturing industries. Right. Now, according to my BLS figures, these nine industries lost 345,000 jobs in the last 20 years. And those are, and those were skilled workers that we lost. Uh, recently, I saw a quote from John Engler, the president of the National Association of Manufacturing, and he was saying that the lack of qualified uh, workers to fill the skilled positions has become a perfect storm. And I, my comment is that John makes it sounds like this is a new revelation. <laughs> His own manufacturing institute and Deloitte have have done seven surveys in the last 30 years since 1993. And every survey it predicted that this skilled worker gap would get worse. And it has. So but instead of fruition. in training. To fruition, yeah. Instead of investing in training, the kind of training that I think we need, the multinationals basically um, have the strategies they used for the problem was to, number one, outsource, number two, to automate factories and get rid of people, and number three, they bought services from foreign companies like mm -hmm. Tool and & Die and Machining, and they poached workers from from their suppliers so here we are you know we're in it we're in a real jam now and uh, michael if i may aaron so when you you do global what do you see in this what do you see with the factories of the future or the fact that we're losing workers which you know like i don't need a survey from deloitte and touche to tell me that i already know that what do you see when you look at the globe well macro trend wise i guess my question from michael would be 
um, are we losing these jobs because we're outsourcing them to countries that can do it for cheaper? Or is it a just uh, because, you know, as a C if, if I were a CEO here, right, it would cost money and really CEOs only care about their shareholders. Um, how would you how would you rectify? How would you encourage, I guess, the training process? Because across the world, cheaper labor always gets the job done for less and CEOs love that. And so the question becomes, how do you how do you encourage that through subsidies or? Well, that's that's true, and that's what happened. Basically, most of those workers were lost because of outsourcing and going to low-cost countries. However, the problem now that we've created because of that is, number one, we've got to replace the 345,000 workers, skilled workers that re we are, we, last year, 364,000 manufacturing jobs were reshored. The Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act projects that we'll need 556,000 new workers to do that. And the, the uh, skilled workers are still retiring by the boxcar loads. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that we we lost a lot of workers through outsourcing for all kinds of reasons. Now we need them. And now the demand is great and we don't have them. And there is no pool of skilled workers. You can't just have human resources, go run an ad in the local right. paper and get a, get a machinist. Those, is, is you there, know, those days are gone. Yeah. Well, so is there, there's a, the, the brain drain is happening because people are retiring out of the workforce and they have all of this wisdom and knowledge. Is there, is there any effort or, uh, or any opportunity probably to get that knowledge, transfer it to the younger generations, the younger workers, and actually make that, make that intergenerational knowledge transfer happen? And wait, before, and the other part to that would be, we don't have vocational schools anymore. So do we need to bring back for, this is for mm -hmm. both of you. Do we need to bring back vocational schools or instead of going to university when you graduate high school, have go to like a one or two year machinist school or vocational school and learn a skill and you don't have to sit in front of, you know, not everybody's going to be a coder. Not That's everybody's right. going to do this, right? So what do we, so what's the answer then? How do we get ourselves from A to Z? Because in another 10 years, we'll kind of be screwed like where we are now. Well, back to your first question about can we get some of the skills of the retiring people and, and get them to the younger workers? Well, that's the objective, but I don't see it happening. No. Okay. And the, the, the thing about vocational schools and, voca and the trades now are starting to come back as an alternative to the university. But, but let, me, let me go back and talk about the kind of skilled worker. The crisis isn't going to be solved by taking a couple of community college classes or mm. online training that what we need is apprentice training, which is, uh, which leads to a journeyman. These are high skilled people. And, and they, and my, my thing, my, my analogy is the kind of training that they, they need is on the floor, do it. You're, you do it, right. skill type training and uh, not computer training. We, and my analogy is learning to ride a bike. You can't, you can read about learning, riding a bike. You can see pictures of people doing it, but you don't know how to do it until you get on one. And, right. and so it's doing it. And so I, the kind of training that we need for all these skilled positions is to do it in the shop, demonstrate that you can do it and check it off. And the best training for that kind of a skilled worker, like a machinist or a foundry man or a num is on the floor training. Right. But in our society today, do you think, and this is for both of you again, do we think that the, 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 the kids today between say 18 and 30, do they have the patience for that? This isn't, unfortunately, this isn't 50 years ago where you knew if you weren't going to go get your university degree, you would go to a vocational school and you knew it took five years to become whatever you were going to become. Today, they want to become whatever they want to become on the second day. I don't think we have the question. patience. Yeah. Okay. 
that's literally my question. How, how do you garner interest? Because the new generation, like Stephen said, I, I just don't see it in, from my interactions every day with them that anyone wants to go into that line of work, mainly because they feel like it's not for them or it's outdated or it's no longer in need or maybe even the pay is not high enough. That's, well, the, big, that's the, the ding, 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 isn't it? The pay? Well, the they pay don't is one, the, the pay is one thing, right. but an, another thing that they have not done for the young people is present manufacturing as a career. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you, if you said, Hey, come, come and be a machinist, we'll put you through a, some community college courses and get you started. That's not what they want to hear. They want to know that if they get into it, they could become a journeyman with a journeyman certificate and make start out at 80,000 a year, you know, and it would be a career field where they have specialties. That's not happening right now. So manufacturing has a tremendous uh, way to go in terms of doing the things that would sell these young people, as Aaron said, who right now are not interested in manufacturing for a variety of reasons. And well, one of the reasons is they've watched their dads and moms get laid off for right. the last 40 years and watched manufacturing be outsourced. And so as an industry, it doesn't, you know, it's not a shining example. Uh, so, and pay is a big issue. You can go, we have an Amazon warehouse. It's right up the street from me right now. And there's a sign on the side of the road that says, start at $24 an hour of free training, no experience necessary, you know? Right. So why should uh, uh, you look at that in terms of why getting into a journeyman machinist program to get a journeyman certificate takes 8,000 hours and four years and 28 skill sets to be really good. That's right. what we need, but it's not happening, as Aaron said. The kids aren't interested. We're going to have to do a hell of a big, much better job in trying to promote it. And well, wages are a big part of it. If if they were interested, let's say we did get. I live out in upstate New York, very rural. If if there were, if we did get the word out, are there even apprenticeship programs, journeyman programs yeah. that we can point people to? Is that yes. something that has to be subsidized and supported, or or? How does that work? That, well, yes, there are. There are two really good ones in Pennsylvania. One is in Cabot, Pennsylvania, by a uh, by a, a company called Penn United, and they 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 have about a hundred apprentices going through their program at a time. There's another one whose name escapes me. We've got several up here in Seattle because of Boeing. There right. there are, but it, it's it, it's not growing. There is a uh, there is a federal office of apprenticeships that keeps track of all of the uh, registered apprentices that are in training in the states. And let me look my figures up here. The last time I looked at it, which was in 2023, there were 23,720 apprentices in manufacturing. That's less than a half a percent of the 13 million people who are in manufacturing. So it's not happening. If mm. you look at in their program, apprentices are growing in all the other fields from baking, you know, to construction, they're growing, but they're not growing in manufacturing. Right. Is, but a lot of, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead Steve. No, go ahead. I was gonna make two points. Is, is part of that, I mean, living in a very pro-capitalist society, a shortage in one field should automatically cause an enough um, increase in demand and pay to where it eventually sucks the talent, right? Ideally, I think if this would if this gets bad enough, provided it's not bad enough right now, would that not automatically jack the pay high enough to where you attract people naturally? Pe people will always look for opportunity. If somebody finds a job for $120,000 versus $60,000, they're going to go for a $120,000 job. There's, there's that aspect of the need fulfilled by just demand alone. And then the, the other option, which I, I guess nobody likes to talk about, is immigration. We can always change it very quickly 
um, the requirements for an H-1B visa, for instance, to where we just give skilled labor an advantage over a university degree, which is something they don't do. And that would automatically bring in a ton of immigration to fill those uh, jobs. Well, it's the it's it's happening right now. The inflation of or the increase in manufacturing pay, even at the entry level, has gone up five or six dollars in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So it is slowly happening. Mm -hmm. And as the demand for the high skilled people, I think you could get out right now if if you got out and got a journeyman level. You could in my area, the Northwest, you could start start out for. 80 plus and there are, are a lot of people who are journeymen who are making 120 years old so it's there the programs though aren't there to mm -hmm. to to do this and let me comment about the your the immigrate you know since immigration is on the tv every time we turn the news on everybody wants to stop the the murderers and rapists from coming across the rio grande Several years ago, I was doing a, uh, I was doing a, a, a webinar in Chicago at the big, uh, the trade show, and I had 120 uh, owners of machine shops in this group, and we got into this whole thing about immigration, whether it was good or bad, and so the last thing I said is I asked them all if they, if they, if we could. Would they condone the government stopping all immigrants from coming across? Not one person raised their hand because these were shops from Florida over to Los Angeles. They all employed uh, and had trained their own Mexican workers and they were the best workers. So, you know, so now they're going to try to stop them. But that, but I could see that that these kinds of workers could would they are trainable and they would really help they would be willing to go into stuff that maybe the uh, wasp white young uh, <laughs> person today wouldn't go in so well, that's, how would that's you say an side american side. in american in general so a lot of immigrants whether you're coming from mexico india pakistan asia whatever will work for less and I don't mean less because you're an immigrant, just they'll take the crappy job to work up. So if they become and, and become an apprentice program that may make them 80, 1,000, whatever, these kids that don't know anything, they want to make 500,000 to a million dollars right off the bat. And they only they only want to work three hours a week. Let's just be, let's just call a spade a spade here. The, the American children are lazy. They're lazy because they weren't taught anything by their parents and their parents weren't taught anything by their parents. So because they have no work ethic, they think working three or four hours a week, they should make $50 million a year. Doesn't work that way. The immigrants come over who are working 100 hours a week and mm -hmm. they get here and someone says, you're going to work 40 or 50. This is like they're on a holiday and they're going to make 80 or 100 or whatever. They're thrilled to death, not the Americans, because the Americans have been spoiled and told how special they are when they're not. And that has a lot to do with it. So I think immigration needs to look at it in a much larger scale than you know, the, the, like you said, mur there's no murders and rapists coming along. We have enough of them just in America that are Americans. I think we need to let people in that actually want to do the work if our people don't want to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so. I say manufacturing needs immigrant workers yeah. of all kinds, you know, because as you say, they work harder, they're yeah. trainable, they'll stay with you, and they're interested in the trades, you know. Yeah. And, you know, back to the university, the university thing, though, might not be uh, the option it was when you and I, when we all went to college, because right. it's colleges have become so expensive. Tuition is so expensive. People then take out loans and they're paying them the rest of their life. So I think it's made uh, alternatives to the university education uh, viable. Yeah, I agree. Well, and going forward, though, like factories of the future, I mean, if you look at some of the Amazon factories and other factories, right, it's all little robots running around and doing this and, you know, and, but the people that work there, like, you know, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't do this, you can't, it's like a little crazy. So as it grows, you're going to need someone to fix the machine, right? So once again, you still need somebody, if you will, a journeyman that understands 
the technological side of how do I fix the machine? You know, you can have a geek with a pocket protector fix the computer, but how do I fix the machine that actually does all the work? And that's what I think people forget is like the little robots running around, not yet, but in about 10 or 20 years, I'm sure they'll fix themselves because how right. 9,000 is coming. But until then, we need humans to actually get them to that point. And I think people don't think through that. I think they just, you know, they think it magically happens to your point of, you know, I can get $24 an hour at an Amazon thing to be a picker for lack of a better term. Well, Stephen, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, in fact, with the because we built these automatic lines and had robots and palletizers and packaging machines and all this fancy stuff, what didn't happen during those 30 years that I was involved is the corporations who bought this stuff did not at the same time train maintenance people to be able to handle. Now, this is space age stuff. As Michael knows, the software and the PLC programs became incredibly complex. It's very difficult. The maintenance didn't work. What we need is, and the kind of worker that could go out and repair, troubleshoot, and operate a, a, a big production line with robots and all the stuff on them is takes two to four years right mm -hmm. and and they so they did they did they skimped on the hiring they didn't invest they did they did maintenance training for you know a couple of classes or you know it, it wasn't the full commitment to uh to a journeyman type of uh right. two to four limb that we needed hence when i was uh, still involved we had enormous problems because the lines would shut down on the graveyard shift and nobody could get them started again. And they would want us to fly from Vancouver, Washington to Poughkeepsie, New York mm -hmm. the next morning. I mean, it became just an enormous problem. So the, the training of the maintenance were just one example, but maintenance workers who could handle these big lines right. didn't happen. And they, as far as I know, Columbia Machine is still, they have 20 service engineers crisscrossing the United States on every given day wow. going to these plants. This is a big problem. It's a big opportunity, but, yeah. it, it, so, but it's a good example of what we need, you know. Right. Well, Aaron, are you seeing it. this geopolitically? I mean, what, what do you think from the, from the global standpoint on this factor of the future and training programs? And from what I've seen, the, the, the people I've worked with, you know, and, and it goes to Michael's point with the a lot of machinery being much cheaper to produce abroad. They import machines for whatever the robotics. And then when something does break, it is an absolute hell because they have to get on this video chat with the country. And then there's a language barrier. And if you're a big enough company, it makes sense to bring all those people here but people want to cut corners. It's all about the bottom, you know, how much can you save? How much can, what's the least you can spend? And it becomes this balancing act of, is it worth it? Is it worth me having somebody on staff that knows how to work on robots? Probably not, I can't, it's not a big enough operation. A lot of, a lot of problems arise because you fall within that small area be between big enough to have your own and too small to have anything at all. So then to be in the middle is where you take the majority of the beating. I think it's it goes back to just the right. It's cheaper to do it the way they're doing it now, which is they import a machine from China, and then something breaks down. Everything is in Chinese. You have to get somebody to speak Mandarin, get on a phone, show a video chat. What's wrong? Plug this in, do that. And that it's it's a it's a brutal it's a brutal process, but it works for the guys who are trying to come up, and I think that's the majority of America because. It's all a bunch of small businesses. The big companies. And the, other, and the other part to that is, and I've seen it, is that the machines are so inexpensive that you can buy two or three of them. So if one breaks, you don't really fix it. You just basically, it's cheaper to pull it out of the line, put the new one in, be down for an hour or two, and let it run. Very um, true. And, Redundancy. And just, so now on production lines, that's not true. The latest high-speed palletizers being manufactured right. in my ex-company are more than a million dollars each without the conveyors. Right. 
without all the rest of the production. These are monstrous. Big. They, these yeah. are, are super complicated lines. You just can't tell you how much engineering goes into these things. These are difficult. I had a conversation on my last, the last uh, time that I was the, the general manager and with a, a division manager for Procter & Gamble. And I was talking to him about the kind of maintenance people that he needed took four to 8,000 hours of training. He told me, Mike, we are never going to fund thousands of hours of training. The ROI is not there. We can't pencil it out. It's not going to happen. And he was right. So they've skimped on it. They don't, you know, but I can tell you that a, a maintenance technician that can go in and handle these giant machines with all the complexity. It's four to 8,000 hours. And, right. it, and half of it, half of it, half of it is classroom training at the community college, but half of it is demonstrating that you can do this by working on the machines on the factory floor. Right. And no work from home then, huh? And, uh, a little bit. <laughs> you can do a little bit work at home, but not all, right? But what I was talking about where people buy two of them, I have friends that own small manufacturing companies, so yep. they're not spending a million dollars on a line. They need a machine that does something specific, and somebody will pick the mold and do whatever out of it. But if that machine breaks, it costs them three or four grand to get it over here. They'll yep. buy two or three. So when it breaks, because they know it's going to break in like when it works a thousand or ten thousand hours, and it's cheaper for them to say, "Good, get rid of it, bring the next one," and that's. Going back to the point of before, we're almost becoming a disposable society. So to your point, yeah. unless I'm Procter & Gamble or Boeing or someone where I've spent millions or hundreds of millions on my production facility, I really do need a person that can do everything, even if the ROI doesn't weigh for it. But if I'm a small guy, it definitely doesn't do it. So what do I do? I buy five machines because it's cheaper. And I can have you know Uncle Louie come in with his wrench and fix it for me uh, or just swap the machines out. So it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to see what happens. But I don't think we're going to be bringing back manufacturing to the States. And I think if we do, it's like I said, how 9,000 is going to do it. He's going to fix himself and he's going to do I, the machines will do it. But until then you still need people, but then they complain why our economy is going down and unemployment and it keeps going through. It's because we're not producing anything and we don't we have don't any mean, jobs. That's that's right. Yeah, we right. Don't, we don't have anything. We're producing what TikTok stars and we're producing I don't know, like, you know, tech people, but they don't produce anything, theoretically. I mean, they produce code, which is wonderful. But at the end of the day, <laughs> I still I still need someone to produce the machine that gives me my food. I still need to someone to produce it's the part machine. Of this, that gives it's, me part of this, it's part of the bigger yeah. solution is to get people right. to do the hands-on work, yeah. pay right. them accordingly, pay them handsomely, and get and them into happen. programs. It's, yeah, well, it sounds like it's not going to happen, I know, but... This sounds like on this show, you heard an opportunity for maintenance technicians, yes. maybe a, as a independent contractors roaming the roaming the country, okay. uh, fixing these these uh, these machines. I mean, look at farming, right? How many people right. were involved in farming, you know, 40 years ago versus today? Mm -hmm. It's yep. all machines and satellite photography. And it's it's just it's become a beast. Except apparently in California, where they pick the almonds and the avocados and, and, and the, the oranges. And the strawberries, right? It's still the the, the migrant labor comes cheap up. Labor. They, cheap labor spends the season and then goes back. So mm -hmm. as much as machinery can do things and robots can do things, they can't do everything. So, you know, yeah. and once again, who's doing the backbreaking labor back in like the 50s? I read this article and the economists are saying 50s, 60s and even 70s was the college students and high school students. That was their summer job. No and then all of a sudden in the 80s, they, they were too good for this. And yeah. it became everyone else. And that's kind of what's happening here. So as the the middle class, which we'll say uh, American middle class, well, I don't care what your color is, is getting pushed out and they're complaining about it. That's because you don't want to do the jobs that the new yeah. immigrants Neither. are coming over. Yeah. That are willing to do. Yeah. So. I would like to make one key sure. point and thing, but because you guys are all very aware of high tech stuff. Some of you work in it. But if you read all the articles about the smart factory, it's about data analytics and machine right. learning and all these fancy technical things on the shop floor. But it never 
talks about the people who are supposed to run all this stuff. The machinists that are supposed to operate these great big CNC mills and so on. So my point is, do, shouldn't we back up? Do we have the cart before the horse here? Shouldn't we back up before we, you know, automate the whole factory, go back and look at this problem of how are these workers, particularly the ones that are coming into manufacturing, how are we going to train them to do their job before we, you know, we we dump all the high technology stuff on them. What do you think of that point? I think I that America's not programs. smart enough. <laughs> well, I would love to see programs that that for the factory of the future machinists, yeah. uh, that, you know, future machinists association of America, just like we have the farmers association of America. Right. Uh, that would be wonderful to see that. And it sounds like there's real opportunity there, even if it's only, even if it's not as many uh, jobs as, as have been lost. Although, Michael, you keep bringing up that, that reshoring is happening, which is good to hear. It is happening. Yeah. So it is not happening. The rate and, and these not the three, rate. these three giant government programs that were passed for, under the Biden administration, they're all creating a lot of manufacturing jobs. So right. the demand is there and it's growing. The, so the jobs are there. The training isn't. Right. So we need training. Very we cool. need training. Aaron, Another opportunity. Yeah. Aaron, and you, I, I'm your more training. So we all agree you need more training. And then the question is, will the American population that needs this actually do it or is it still going to end up going to the immigrant worker you know the foreigner who comes in and goes i'll do it i'm here i need a job right where i, I here still I, I just yeah, don't I don't it's um you know if it, like in the middle east in the gulf you will see where the locals never lift a finger they, they just won't do those jobs and they're like that's right. what immigrants are for and there's right. like four immigrants for every one local and i think we're a a, a, a lighter shade of that where mm -hmm. we just won't go pick the strawberries or like we have immigrants for that. It's just become this very, I won't do that. I won't do manufacturing. I'd rather do mm -hmm. sit behind a desk, work from home. Or, you know, they, nobody wants to do those jobs. I feel like the new generation just feels very entitled and they're just not willing to do that kind of work because they look down on it, which is sad. Yeah, it's sad not, you're, and a huge know. mistake and a huge miscalculation. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's we're it's a different generation. Like I said, it's a different generation, and we can probably go back into the uh, probably the '60s or the '70s. Most, I guess, the '80s is when the parents stopped being parents, and they were like, "You need to be your child's friend," and that's kind of where we took, if you will, America took a left turn instead of a right turn. Instead of saying, "Work hard," you know, be smart, play hard, work hard, go to school, whether you go to vocational school or university, right. go and work, be productive, be a good whatever. Now it's like go home and watch your computer all day. And I'm like, yeah, no. So a lot of that, I think we have to come back. Yeah. Right. I mean, Stephen, if you look at it, it's a lot harder today than it was before, right? Yep. As the world comes up economically, the, the amount of resources, it does become a, 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 a version of a zero sum game as the yep. rest of the world pulls away from the same resources that we use as less for us to consume, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 60 years ago, China consumed very little. And now they're competing with them, right? There's a, the middle class in China is coming up. They're as big as the entire U.S. put together. We yeah. have this competition around the world as everyone's trying to do better and provide for their countries. Now there's it's harder to get those resources, and that tickles down all the way to the individual. He's like, I provide for his family. It's harder now. Two income and there was an family, one income family. And there, was, and there was an article in the FT, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday of this week, and it said, now small Chinese companies can't compete within China, so you know where they're coming? United States. So it's no longer, we are not, we are not the, the sugar daddy of the planet anymore. You know, there's many of them. China is the big one. India is up and coming and there they'll be, even I read an article, it says in about 20 years, Mexico will be up and coming because they're, they keep going forward and forward and everybody goes poo poo on Mexico, but Mexico is no, coming. Sense. Man, we yeah, should we're bring be, all our manufacturing to Mexico from China, ideally. I agree. Yes. Yeah. But, they, but who has a trade agreement with China? <clears throat> Mexico. Yeah. Who's buying the Chinese BYD car? Mexico. We're not because our government's like, oh, it's China. So I think we have to re have a rethink, um, maybe geopolitically on a global level. And Very that'll much. help everybody out. If not, I think we have, we're just going down a, a slippery slope, as they say. But what well, do I know? 
So, yeah. All right. Well, well, final well, thoughts, yeah. Mike. Yeah, yeah. Final I, thoughts. I want to want to go back to what I said about one of the reasons we're in the jam we're in right now of not having these skilled workers. A grib, big part of the problem is was driven by the multinationals. As I said in my book, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. American Dream. The 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 multinationals basically did they they did everything they could to buy or you know or offshore or what the services are supposed. They didn't train the workers. And I was just looking at Manu the Na National Association of Manufacturers survey of their own members, and it showed that last year the average member did an average of 27 hours a year per person, per worker. So what does that tell you? You know, they, it's coming at them. It's, you know, it's going to hit them just as hard as it is everybody else. They haven't done it. And I still have not seen any re any uh, effort to try to address this highly skilled worker type. Right. Thing. Well, maybe we need another, uh, another massive bill to encourage uh, the future of machinists in America training the next generation of machinists. Uh, we'll see what happens in November. We'll first. <laughs> I think with an infrastructure bill, they should do that instead of printing money and giving it out. They should incentivize, you know, school banks. Whatnot. The infrastructure bill is going to create 550,000 new jobs in manufacturing alone, not just in construction. So between that and reshoring, the demand is going up. We just don't have the people and uh, yeah. And you know, so it's a complicated problem. And Steven says it gets back to starts out with, okay, if that's true and there's opportunity here, what are we going to say to the 18 year old kid coming out of high school to entice them to take a shot at this? You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, they were, it's going to require a very different uh, a recruitment program, a lot more money, and and I think it is describing it as a career opportunity where you could take them up to get up to the skills where they can get into some real money, and that hasn't happened yet. Let's hope it happens sooner rather than later, or how 2001 will or be. Or how will do it. How is going to do all the work? So do everything anyway. Anyway. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Aaron, it was a pleasure. Next time, you, don't, don't be don't be so quiet. Um, Michael, always a pleasure to see you. We will see you both back uh, soon. Aaron, come back again as soon as you'd like. Michael, we'll probably see you in a couple of months when something new and exciting happens. Okay. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Have a great one. Cheers. Bye-bye. On to On lost to. Oh, now it's uh, Now it's lost and found. I've got good oh, ones this boy. week. What a, what a <laughs> rousing discussion, though. That's really that was good. really. I, and I, you know, I felt bad for Aaron because I know Michael's very, that's why, you know, I was like, my Aaron. So I think I'm going to ask Aaron to come back on with us, the normal crew. So yeah. Aaron can give us more about Aaron. I want to um, hear geopolitics. Oh yeah. I do too. So we'll ask him, maybe he can come next week if he wants. We'll find out yeah. if uh, that works for him. But anyway, let's go into some lost and found and that gave everybody something to think about. But here we'll come up with some lighter side of the world. Welcome to this week's lost and found uncovering dollar winners and losers where we discuss dollars lost and dollars gained by various companies and projects. Oh, here we go. This is my favorite. So either one of us, flip a call. I'll go first for once. How's that? Here we go. My favorite story all week, and there was a lot, but this one just made me get a chubby and I was so happy. Elon Musk's $55 billion comp plan was killed by a Delaware court judge who yeah. said, you stack the board. And basically, the FT had an article today that said, your board's a bunch of idiots. And then what does Elon say? I'm going to move my company from Delaware Corp as a Texas company because a Texas judge won't do that. My mind is, what did you do that is so great that you deserve $55 billion? You did nothing. 
you have a, a shitty product, product, you have a shitty product, and it's, as the guys from the smoking tire would say, you have a Ponzi scheme allegedly going on with your car. It's mm. the worst product in the world. Why people like you, I have no idea. None of these ideas are yours. They're all, you bought Tesla for somebody else, which I told that to somebody, they didn't know that he didn't start Tesla. Right. He bought it's that from someone else. Fact. Very important yep, yep. fact. Yeah. His boring company is using a patent from 1869. His space company is using patents from the 60s. He has thought of nothing. All he's done is thrown money at stuff, and he, he acts like a five-year-old. So the best thing, I'm, and if we had the boom, 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 I am so happy the judge said you don't get a 55 billion. Yeah, he's a pussy. He won't come on. I said he, he didn't get his $55 billion. I am so happy. No one needs a $55 billion package for you didn't do squat for 55 billion. That's I'm a, sorry. It's, it's, it's an insane number. It's an insane yeah. number. It would be the largest in corporate history, and it's not necessary for I any human that. being on this planet. But listen, I'm, I'm not even thrilled that Jamie Dimon makes $43 million a year, but at least I saw what he took when he took Morgan to what it was to what it is, and he keeps innovating and doing things. There's mm -hmm. a value there. Do I agree with the $43 million? I'm not overly thrilled with it, but I get it. But fifty-five billion? Are you freaking? The shareholders were suing. Everyone's suing. I'm so happy. This Delaware judge, ma ma ma, love you. There you She's go. The that's, that's a found dollar right there for there Delaware. There you go. Yeah. If she wants to come on our show any day go. of the week, uh, there you no, go. That would be the one. That's good. That would be the one to come on. What do you have? Well, I've got uh, in the theme of manufacturing. Okay. Our good friend Mark Zuckerberg. Meta Marky. CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. Marky. Uh, they want to, and they're in the, in the efforts, they've been doing this for a few years now, <clears throat> actually creating their own chips, their own AI chips, okay. uh, so that they don't have to buy so many from NVIDIA. Because okay. right now, uh, by the end of this year, they're going to buy another 350,000 processors from NVIDIA. Wow. And they figure, look, if we can we can create the chips in house. We don't have to pay as much, and it makes sense. Look at him thinking AI is taking over, trying to take over. I know that today in the FT they were talking about one. They lost four. They lost four point five nine billion dollars last quarter because of, of a lot of things. They also um, their meta is not doing so good um, because there's no content. And there's companies Division that have content. Pro, anything. The Vision Pro is out or the coming Vision. out. Yeah, yeah you the can Apple order the Vision the, Pro. Yeah, the Apple's what, $2,300? And everybody says it's wonderful. It's 3500 $3, Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, because that makes it better. $3,500 <laughs> so I can feel like I'm engulfed in real world. And I we'll saw at CES, yeah. at CES, there's a laptop that is a keyboard, and you put on the special glasses, and it puts AR, VR for you. And I'm like, interesting for $2,300. It's like buying an Apple. And I'm just yeah. saying, but why? Like, I mean, I, unless it's like the Marty, Minority Report with Tom Cruise, where I can push things good. in the sky, be good. then then I'm okay with it. But until that, no. And I don't see, I've seen the meta, um, I've seen their 3D. It's right. still very blockish and childish. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's other companies out there that do much better. And I'm like, I like those companies better. Granted, no one knows who you are because you're small little companies, but I like those companies better because their graphics are better and I feel more engaged. The meta thing to me is sort of like, okay, you're trying to like do something, but there's you're not innovation. really ready to do it. Where's yeah, the there's no, that's, what, yeah. that's what you always ask of these big companies. Where's the innovation? And a 30, lot of it is happening in small companies. $30 billion worth of crap. And I know a company that spent 16 million and their graphics look a hundred times better and you feel more engaged when you're in um, their 3D world, listening to music or running around, more engaged. And I'm like, Meta, yeah. they spent 16 huh. million and you spent 30 billion and your stuff looks like shit. So, <laughs> but you know, they, they have a name it's and the little going. company doesn't. And They're it has, going yeah. out there. It's a trip. It's a trip. Well, this was fun. I'm sorry yes. the guys couldn't be here. Not really. I, John's probably going to get captured and we'll never hear from him again. No. Um, <laughs> well, I think next week everybody's awesome. back. Yeah. No, this will be good. This is good that we had. This is good. This is good. Uh, this is good. So everybody, thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. We hope you learned something, um, especially your CEOs and people that are contemplating what to do with your manufacturing plants. If you need to get a hold of Michael, 
we'll put you in touch with them if you want to if you want to learn some not this michael the other michael us yeah, two, you don't want to talk to us we know we well, don't i'm going to spin up a uh, a contractor independent contractor. I, just, I say right so but if you need to get a hold of michael collins we'll put you in touch with him we'll have aaron back so he can tell us more about geopolitical things um and we'll see everybody next saturday morning at six o'clock new york time and you can figure out the rest of where Never you are at 6 a.m est everybody so there you go and everybody have a wonderful week enjoy um, after this, we have um, No Snobs or Knobs on our channel. And then I think there's a few other shows now on Saturday. So enjoy what you see, and we'll see you all next week. Have a great day. Mike, see you later. Mm -hmm. Cheers.